Thanks for having me. Can everybody hear me? Is this mic on? Great. Uh, so yeah, I am a lawyer for the Electronic Frontier Foundation in San Francisco. I am. Uh, I was a web developer in a very long past life. Uh, I was a Microsoft front page administrator for the city of Santa Monica, so that dates me a little bit. Um, I am not your lawyer. I will not be giving you legal advice uh, in this very much non-privileged context. This is being recorded and streamed. If you have questions, I would be happy to answer them in a more private setting. Um, I've been working on cryptography policy for the last two and a half, three years at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And the last year, and especially the last couple of months, have been a very exciting time. The things that I've been working on uh, for years have, been, have become dinner table conversation. And that's different. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the past, about how we got here, about where we are, what's happening, and what has just happened. Uh, and I'm going to make some predictions and talk about the future, where I expect us to be what I think is likely, what I think is unlikely uh, in 2016, and maybe even a little bit out beyond that. One of the founders of EFF and something like the number four employee at Sun Microsystems, John Gilmore, in 1993, said that the internet interprets censorship as damage and routes around it. In 93, there was no Tor, there were essentially no VPNs, there were no anonymizing proxies. We barely had the first inklings of TLS, uh, but there were words and there were lots of them, and images and code and politics and art. And for more than two decades, the internet has provided us with a truly global platform for expression. Uh, today, anyone can write an opposition party blog post and get it up anonymously. Uh, post photographs of, of their cats, which I do a lot if you follow me on Twitter. Uh, organize a street protest, contribute to open source crypto projects, uh, participate in the search for extraterrestrial life, mine for bitcoins, uh, swap selfies, use PGP, or send 419 scam emails from Nigeria. Uh, you, can, you can do any or all of that. Not that I recommend that you do all of that. Um, the first crypto wars in the 1990s uh, made this illegal. Uh, this is a Perl implementation of RSA, which is actually an anachronism. Perl didn't exist then. Um, but in the 1990s, uh, it was illegal to do what I am doing right now. You could not post this publicly. Uh, the United States government attempted to regulate this. Uh, this was a weapon. And in order to post it on the internet, you had to get a license, the same type of license that you'd have to get if you wanted to sell hand grenades, tanks, or nerve gas uh, to get this posted. Remember Netscape Navigator? Uh, if you wanted a full version of Netscape with actual TLS, which we then called SSL, uh, all you had to do was click a button that said you were inside the United States and you got the 128-bit version. Otherwise, you got a 40-bit version because that's all that the US government said uh, that it was legal to export. Uh, encryption with a key length of more than 40 bits was a weapon. Military grade, which is a word that needs to go away, and I never want to hear any of you say ever again uh, in relation to encryption. And its export was illegal. But there were no geo blocks. There was no IP fencing. There was nothing like that in the 1990s. And so the regulation ended up being an ineffectual checkbox. Are you in the US or not? Uh, and I'm going to get back to that in a little bit. And what we ended up was things like this. We saw people putting algorithms on t-shirts. We saw Theo Durat doing his work in Canada where the export laws didn't apply. Anyone recognize this? <laughs> uh, but I'm a lawyer and EFF is an organization of lawyers among other things. And if all you have is a hammer, then everything starts to look like a nail. So we represented uh, a Berkeley grad student, young man named Daniel J. Bernstein, uh, who had designed an algorithm known as Snuffle. Uh, and he wanted to talk about it. He wanted to present papers about it. And he wanted to publish his dissertation on the internet. Uh, his dissertation didn't actually even contain the algorithm. It only contained a description of it. 
uh, and he was banned from doing so. The State Department listed encryption on ITAR, the arms regulations that I described earlier, and so we went to court. We represented DJB, and we sued the Department of Justice, and we won. Uh, we, we got a ruling from the Northern District of California that code is speech. Uh, that ruling was upheld by a panel of the Ninth Circuit. That the Ninth Circuit panel opinion is no longer applicable, but that's neither here nor there. The ruling stands. Code is speech. It's expression. And the internet is a safer place for it. Uh, we, in 1996, launched the Golden Key campaign. Golden Keys meant something a little bit different then than they do now. Uh, and we encouraged webmasters to put this image on their homepage uh, as, a, as a response to the clipper chip. For those of you of a certain age, you'll remember that, among other key escrow uh, requirement uh, possibilities. And encryption today is legal. We won, or we thought we had. Uh, encryption is legal and export exportable. Our friends in Mountain View and Cupertino are free to ship products you know, like this that have strong encryption on them. Uh, people like Moxie and Adam Langley are free to publish their free Libra and open source crypto uh, tools for anyone and all to use. Uh, right now, right here in this room, we are free to publicly discuss cryptography to our heart's content. But thanks to the FBI Director James Comey, more work remains. And we're back. <laughs> Everything that was old is new again. 2015 brought us a new set of challenges. iOS 8 and Android M brought us full disk encryption by default. You can put a little asterisk next to Android M, but anyway, Android. Uh, most flagship Android phones are encrypted by default. Uh, WhatsApp joined iMessage to say nothing of Signal, uh, Wire, please don't use Telegram. Um, but the, the other ones you can use. Uh, so now we have, with WhatsApp, a billion people using strong end-to-end -end crypto every day. And the director of the FBI is pissed, very pissed. <laughs> and he wants legislation. Um, and it's our job to make sure he doesn't get it. The conversation started with device encryption, uh, but very quickly moved to end-to-end -to -end communications. Uh, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom asked, are we going to allow a means of communications which simply isn't possible to read? Um, I think that we can agree to the, ans uh, the answer to that question is yes. Um, and it's not a matter of allowing it. It's the fact that it exists and there's nothing any government can do about it. See slide one. Okay, so what if we renamed back doors? What if we called them front doors? <laughs> or what if we asked the wizards in Mountain View and Cupertino to create a secure golden key? Okay, well, I want a pony, and I'm not going to get one. <laughs> um, this slide is false. NSLs are not magic. There is no legal tool in the United States that can force a developer or a company to insert a backdoor. It doesn't exist, or to compromise crypto, or to shorten key length, you name it. Uh, that's it. There, there's no requirement to be able to provide plain text on demand. Um, if you are a developer, or if you work at a company, and you get such a demand from a US entity, US government entity, uh, email me. Please, I will put my email address on the last slide. Um, I would love to take that case. <laughs> um, but we're not done. Uh, as I said earlier, we thought we had solved the field, but unfortunately more work remains. Uh, many countries around the world are considering legislation to mandate a backdoor, to mandate access to plain text, or otherwise endanger encryption. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that now. Uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, the Snoopers Charter, also known as the Investigatory Powers Bill, uh, is currently being debated by Parliament. And it's really bad. Uh, it would contain a legal obligation to, at the Home Secretary's discretion, if she determines that it's practicable in her own judgment, uh, and Theresa May has some pretty bad judgment for any of you following UK politics, uh, can order 
operators to remove electronic protection. And it doesn't really talk about anything else there. Um, but if you ask GCHQ, what they say is that uh, this can, this will permit Theresa May at her, at her personal discretion to ban end-to-end -end encryption in the United Kingdom. Uh, the chances of this passing seem pretty good at this point. In Australia, uh, they passed the Defense Trade Controls Act. They spelled defense wrong, but they do that a lot down there. Uh, <laughs> that prohibits the intangible supply of encryption technologies without an export license. Um, that includes teaching it. It is now illegal in Australian universities for professors of mathematics or computer science or computer engineering to teach encryption without getting an export license. That's ridiculous, um, but that's the law in Australia today. Um, by the way, most professors down there flaunt, flaunt it regularly, um, bless them. Uh, India last fall released a draft uh, policy on encryption that would have required everyone using encryption to store plain text for 90 days uh, and cap key lengths at 64 bits. Um, they withdrew it, but I think it can be safely assumed that it'll be back in another form. Uh, China passed an anti-terrorism law last year. Uh, the draft version would have required companies to hand over encryption codes. Uh, that came out of the draft, but in the final, uh, you can see what they put in instead. Ooh, it got dark. It got light. In the fall, the president said he didn't, well, he didn't actually say this. This was an official leak to the Washington Post. Um, pro tip, if you ever see Ellen Nakashima's byline in the Washington Post, she's a great reporter. I love her to death. Um, but she gets all the official leaks. So if you see Ellen Nakashima quoting unnamed administration sources, she is both right and that's official. So anyway, uh, this was an Ellen Nakashima article in the Washington Post that Obama was quoted as saying that we will not, for now, call for legislation requiring companies to decode messages for law enforcement. Uh, and of course, there's a, a bullet there. Uh, but Bloomberg leaked a National Security Council memo from a little bit before when Obama said this, which was, uh, they are not going to pursue legislation right now. They're going to instead wait for something big to happen. Uh, that was sometime around Thanksgiving, and of course, something big happened just a couple of weeks later in San Bernardino. And we got Apple versus FBI. Uh, this, uh, I, I can talk a little bit about this. The, the legal geekery is of interest pretty much only to lawyers. Um, but what was this case really about? This case was about the FBI wanting the ability to mandate that companies turn our devices into tools of surveillance. It was not about this one phone, and it never was. Uh, the National Security Memo, National Security Council Memo that Bloomberg leaked, uh, I think, demonstrates that quite well. This was the uh, the tragedy that the DOJ cynically exploited to seek what they had been wanting for about a year and a half. Uh, it's about a master key. The, the particular iOS version that, they, that Apple was being asked to code in San Bernardino probably wouldn't have functioned as a master key. There are ways of making sure that it only would have booted on that one phone, but that's neither here nor there because it wasn't about that phone. It was about the legal precedent. And the legal precedent isn't a technical master key, but it is a master key. And the only reason that the FBI pursued the case was to set the legal precedent. Uh, Comey admitted so in, uh, under oath in a hearing in the House uh, in March. Uh, they want the ability to demand that US tech providers stop providing end-to-end -end encryption or secure device storage. Uh, and the FBI saw this case as win-win. If they won in San Bernardino, they would have an order that they could then take to courts around the country and get follow-on orders to kill and to end encryption as we saw it. But if they lost in San Bernardino, they could take that loss to Congress and say, look, we don't have the legal powers that we need. Um, there's also, there also was a case in the Eastern District of New York. That case went away last night at about 8 p.m. Uh, when the government gave up, just like they did on the eve of the hearing in San Bernardino. 
Uh, the FBI strategy was flawed for three reasons. Uh, first, legally, what the FBI was asking for would have represented a fundamental shift in the way that American courts interpret the All Writs Act. Um, no court, for instance, had ever ordered Brinks to create a master key. That had never happened. Uh, and that is essentially what FBI was asking Apple to do here. Uh, it was flawed technically. We barely know how to create secure systems. And if you think that this is 100% secure, you're fooling yourself and everyone around you. Uh, the fact that FBI is demand seriously demanding that we make our systems less secure is insane to me. Uh, we can barely keep data out of the hands of people who shouldn't have it. Uh, and to make that harder uh, doesn't make any sense. And it's flawed for policy reasons. Uh, if FBI got what it was asking for in San Bernardino, it would have absolutely crippled American business. Um, there's no way that anyone outside the US would buy uh, devices that they knew were backdoored. Um, and then foreign governments would demand exactly the same access. And Comey has no answer for how to prevent that. There's some other litigation going on too, maybe. We don't really know. Um, it's not all Ritz Act litigation. Uh, the New York Times had a report that WhatsApp, uh, which is owned by Facebook, is under a decryption order. We think that's not being actively litigated. We think that there's doing, they have a wait and see uh, stance there, but we don't really know. Um, there may be FISA court orders. We don't think that there are. Uh, we've heard some rumors, but they're not particularly credible. Um, Ellen Nakashima hasn't published an article in the Washington Post saying that it's happened. Um, and just this week, we filed a, a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit uh, to demand answers on that. And we think we actually have a pretty decent chance at that one. Uh, the USA Freedom Act, which was passed in June of last year, requires that FISA court opinions that contain a newer significant interpretation of law, and this certainly would be, are required to be declassified. So that's, uh, that's the, the, um, the core of our lawsuit that we filed last week. Um, but there is a bill in Congress. It was leaked a couple of weeks ago and then formally introduced as a discussion draft uh, last week that would require providers to decrypt uh, communications or devices on demand. Uh, it carries civil and criminal, criminal penalties for manufacturers who don't. Uh, and as, as I said, applies to communications, storage, and licensing. What does that mean? It means it includes app stores and open source. It means that GitHub is all of a sudden illegal, as is the Apple App Store, as is the Play Store, because they're not scouring every application to make sure they don't include end-to-end -end encryption um, or otherwise non-key escrowed encryption. Uh, and it's not just end-to-end -end and full disk that, uh, that the Burr-Feinstein bill would outlaw. Uh, it would also outlaw computers as we know them, because there's no way of keeping a computer, I mean, these are general purpose Turing devices, right? There's no way of keeping a computer from running an encryption, encryption algorithm that the FBI doesn't have click of the mouse access to. And that's what Burr Feinstein would demand. Um, I'm, as a aside, I'm a lifelong Californian and to see my senator's name up there is uh, depressing. Um, and as I said, Burr Feinstein is problematic on every possible level, it's unconstitutional. As we, uh, as we saw at the beginning of this talk, uh, code is speech. And to, uh, to ban end-to-end -end encryption, including open source, is a prior restraint. And I have a, a post up at EFF from last summer uh, talking about why exactly this bill would be unconstitutional, even though I, hadn't, I was 10 months away from seeing the bill. Uh, it would break the internet as we know it. I mean, it would mandate that everything be decryptable all the time, and that's not, just not how encryption works. Uh, it would cripple American business for the reasons that I already discussed, and it would be totally ineffective, right? The internet interprets censorship as damage and routes around it. We can all get PGP, we all probably have end-to-end -end crypto, and there's nothing anyone can do to change that fact. That is just a fact. Um, and law enforcement needs to learn to, to live with it. So in 2016, what are we looking at? Uh, what 
So I, I've done Christmas past and Christmas present, and now I'm going to do Christmas yet to come. Uh, what are we, what are we, re, what are we, what are our options? Well, we could do something like China and have a, a, a key escrow mandate. Um, the New York Attorney General has a key escrow mandate, which, which was put into effect last year for banks. Um, so banks that use secure communications within themselves. Um, Symphony is the big, uh, big provider of that. Um, now have to escrow all of their keys. So we might, we, we're looking at something like that, but I don't think that's actually going to happen, at least not on a federal level. Uh, Burr Feinstein, we're definitely looking there, um, but that definitely won't happen, right? Burr Feinstein is crazy pants uh, and is, doesn't have a realistic chance of making it out of committee. But I think this has a sort of better chance. Uh, Burr Feinstein, we think, was actually introduced as an opening gambit. Um, it was, you know, when you sit down, I'm going to use a lawyer analogy, which probably, you know, you'll get it. And when you sit down at a mediation and you, your opening demand is $30 quadrillion, right? Everyone knows that you're not asking for more money than exists in the universe. Um, you're, you're giving that as an opening demand because you're going to back down from it. And that's what Burr Feinstein was. Um, so we're going to get something maybe more like that last bullet. We don't care how as long as you make plain text available. And now I'm going to go into real prediction mode. What's actually likely? Informal pressure. So one of the things that I do at, at the Electronic Frontier Foundation is I'm on the coders' rights team. I represent developers, academics, hackers, cryptographers, uh, and occasionally small and even sometimes not so small companies. Uh, and this happens a lot. You'll get a call from an FBI agent says, can we set up a meeting? We have some things to talk about. You say, sure. They show up, and they show up with an NSA agent as well sometimes. And they say, if you don't backdoor your crypto, you will have blood on your hands. And they show you some sort of evidence that ISIS is using your product. This happens a lot. Um, I've dealt with it um, a, hand, a handful of times. And I'm just one of the lawyers at EFF. No ban is going to reach free or open source crypto. That's just not going to happen. Um, it's way too problematic because we have this thing called the First Amendment here. Um, so that's not going to happen. Uh, we might get a CALEA-like mandate. CALEA is the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act passed in 1994, which says that the telephone networks, now including VoIP, uh, need to be wiretappable. We might get something like this. Uh, it won't hit software, it won't necessarily hit device encryption, but it might say that if you provide an end-to-end -end encrypted service, you have to have a way of getting it plain text. That's not going to stop OTR, it probably won't even stop Signal, um, but it might stop WhatsApp and iMessage. Um, and that doesn't have a lot of the same First Amendment flaws uh, that the Burr-Feinstein bill would have. Uh, India, Australia, and the UK may or maybe already have done really stupid things. Um, Kazakhstan is mandating that everyone include a, uh, a, their own certificate in your, in your trust store now so that they can man in the middle all of your TS, uh, TLS connections. Um, so things like that might start happening around the world. But until it happens in the US, it's not going to really catch on. Um, but no matter what happens, it's not going to stop anyone with even a modicum of sophistication from going dark. Going dark is what the FBI calls encryption. It means people using technology that they can't immediately wiretap. Um, there's nothing FBI can do about that. Um, that's sort of the beauty of open source. So here are my predictions. My predictions are the US government is going to go after defaults, not primitives. What do I mean by that? They don't care. If people like you, people who go to B-Sides Rochester, are capable of using uh, PGP or OTR, they don't give a crap about that. What they care about is average Americans, and they want to deny average Americans uh, their digital security. We will see a lot of backdoor pressure, and I don't think that we're going to see a backdoor mandate passed in 2016. I would be surprised uh, if that happened. Um, but we will see lots of pressure, uh, pressure on companies like Google, Facebook, and Apple especially. 
Um, I don't really think that they care about Signal. I don't really think that they care about PGP. They care a lot about WhatsApp. They care a lot about iMessage. Uh, and they're going to try as hard as they can um, to make those guys stop encrypting by default. And as I said, any mandate that does pass will affect only the masses. It won't affect ISIS. It won't affect uh, international pedophile rings. It won't affect organized crime. Why? Because as I said earlier, anyone with a modicum of sophistication is free to use crypto. There's nothing anyone can do about that. Uh, and we might get court rulings for the first time. Uh, we thought that we were going to get one in San Bernardino. We thought we were going to get one in New York. The FBI pulled the plug on both of those. Um, the, th that wasn't particularly surprising to me, but it, it, wasn't, um, it, it wasn't exactly expected either. So we haven't gotten a court ruling on crypto since the 90s. We might get one this year. And that's it. Questions? Um, so, okay, so that's a great question. I'll, I'll repeat it for people who couldn't hear being recorded. To what extent does the degradation, degradation of security for the masses harm us, the people in this room? Uh, privacy isn't about you, right? Security isn't about you. I don't have anything to say, and yet I benefit from the First Amendment. I benefit from other people having the right to free speech just as I benefit from other people having the right to privacy. Um, social movements don't start in public, they start in private. Having, uh, having security for people who aren't tech savvy is critical. Um, that's the way that social change works and security and privacy are critical. Uh, they're, they're prerequisites for democracy. And without security and privacy, we can't, have, we can't do the hard work that social change requires. Uh, the civil rights movement um, almost ended because of J. Edgar Hoover and, and ubiquitous surveillance. It almost ended before it started. Um, and that's not something that I'm, I'm willing to gamble on. Uh, and especially people around the world, right? If you're an LGBT activist in Saudi Arabia, you fucking need crypto. Um, and you need it bad. Um, if you're International Committee for the Red Cross Red Crescent in Syria, you need crypto, and you need it really badly. Um, and, deny, and, and WhatsApp is how they get it right now. iMessage is how they get it right now. Um, you, we, you can do security trainings for people doing work uh, outside the country, and it might stick, it might not, um, but it needs to be ubiquitous. Otherwise, you get things... Um, uh, you. You, you can't get social change. Yeah? A few slides ago, you talked about one of the possibilities could be with uh, like a wiretap the way we have on phones. Maybe I'm splitting hairs, but isn't that kind of like a backdoor? Yeah. Okay, so it would be the same thing. Um, yeah, there, there, are some legal, there are some legal differences. So they, that would only, that wouldn't, uh, those sorts of requirements don't apply to products, they only apply to services. So uh, it, it's a lot easier to pass a law that says you can't provide a messaging service without a backdoor than it is to say you can't provide a messaging client without a backdoor. There's some stupid First Amendment and due process reasons why that's true. Yeah? Doesn't scale. I mean, that might work on a one-off, but it doesn't scale. So it looks to me like uh, the FBI is really going after the content of communications here. Yep. Do you see any bad lines being drawn now or in the future on anonymizing, agent, uh, anonymizing software protecting metadata? Um, that's, a, that's actually a really good question. Uh, maybe. So we haven't, so things like Tor Messenger and Pond, don't use Pond, but things like, Tor, oh, sure. Uh, so the, the, the question was, right now it looks like the focus is on content, but what about uh, anonymizing or metadata masking 
Um, has FBI started to attack that? Uh, and the answer is no, not yet, because I think no one really uses it. No one uses Tor Messenger, or at least no one that the FBI cares about. Um, no one uses Pond, uh, nor should you, because Adam hasn't uh, updated it in like a year and a half. Um, but it, that's possible that we might get something like that. Right, we saw uh, the, the former head of the CIA say that we kill people based on metadata, right? The NSA and the CIA almost don't care about content. They really just care about uh, when, where, and to, from. They don't care about the what. Uh, they don't even need to know what's being said or even who's saying it, um, so long as they, they know the connections. Um, so this is really about law enforcement. Law enforcement wants content. Um, intelligence agencies are fine not getting content. They're fine with metadata. So this attention really comes in when something uh, blows out of scale. Yeah, so we, we might get some tension on anonymizing uh, or metadata masking if those tools become useful at scale. They're not yet. You said a few more words on the intelligence community. I thought, that we, I know a couple of former heads of the intelligence community have come out and actually in favor of encryption. I thought it was more because, hey, they're just going to steal the key from the license of data. That's, so that's possible. The question is, uh, heads of in, former heads of intelligence agencies here in the States have come out in favor of encryption. Um, there's a number of reasons why. Uh, stealing keys is certainly one of them. Um, interestingly, the Burr-Feinstein bill is in the Senate Intelligence Committee, not in Judiciary or Energy and Commerce. Uh, so that's interesting um, that the Intelligence Committee in the Senate is what's pushing backdoors, even though the intelligence community doesn't seem to be. So my, my response to, if I don't have anything to hide, why should I care about encryption, is essentially what I said earlier about privacy. It's not about you, it's about everybody else. It's, and, and you have nothing to hide is irrelevant. Um, there are people with things to hide, and that's a positive for society. Um, the, other, uh, the, the other response um, that I have is, in 2013, according to a poll by IDG and Lookout, Something like four million phones were lost or stolen in the US. Fully a quarter of those lost or stolen devices uh, ended up uh, causing identity theft. One quarter, a million phones, uh, a million Americans uh, were victims of identity theft because of lost or stolen phones. Uh, that's not true anymore. With full disk encryption, that has stopped. Uh, that's the other thing, right? If FBI gets its way, we're right back to where we were. All the way in the back. So, uh, your presentation focused a lot on the federal level, but do you see this making its way into local municipalities or sheriff's offices? Uh, great question. Uh, do I see this trickling down to the states? Uh, yes and no on two different levels. So, both California and New York have proposed legislation that would require phones sold in those states to have backdoors. Um, both of those bills are unconstitutional because they violate something called the Dormant Commerce Clause. Um, pretty cut and dried. So we're not going to see legislation on the state level. Um, in terms of local sheriffs and whatnot demanding the same access as FBI, I mean, sure, they're, they're going to ask for it. I don't think they're going to get it, right? NSA has a whole lot more than FBI has, and they don't share their toys. I don't see FBI sharing its toys with, with local PDs. It's possible, I don't see it though. Yeah. I have a question, because I'm real big on the law part, but since you said code is speech, and we have court rulings saying certain speech is not allowed to be said, like fire in my computer, if I just scream fire and everyone panics, that's technically against freedom of speech. So, uh, code, yes. So code is speech, but speech is, the, the First Amendment is not absolute. 
right? So if a requirement, and I'll, I'll go deep into the law a little bit for a second, if a requirement uh, would affect speech based on content, which any end-to-end -end encryption ban would, then it has to meet what's called strict scrutiny. So it has to be na narrowly tailored for a compelling governmental interest. Narrow tailoring means it has to be neither overbroad nor underbroad. Uh, here, any ban on crypto would be both overbroad and underbroad. So saying code is speech, you're right, that's not, that doesn't mean anything sort of from an absolutist perspective, but what it means is any regulation on code is going to be subject to strict scrutiny and it wouldn't pass. Yeah, so the, the core post has been debunked, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. So the question is, uh, yeah, there is some end-to-end, -end, but really most things are still just, I wouldn't say plain text, I'd say TLS. Uh, and that's absolutely true. Um, it's absolutely true that Google has access to your Gmail and they, they are going to keep that forever because they want to scan it and, and display you ads. Same with Facebook Messenger. Um, the issue is, there is, is whether end-to-end -end encrypted tools are legal, right? Um, because if they're not, that has huge trickle-down effects uh, to the rest of the ecosystem. So, yeah, people are free to use whatever tools they like. Um, I actually sign, and this, uh, this again dates me, I sign into AOL Instant Messenger every day is one of the <laughs> protocols that my, uh, my chat client signs into. Um, of course, every conversation I have there is OTR. So, yeah, there are, there are plain text protocols, and that's fine. Um, that's a business model choice, but it needs to stay a business model choice. It can't become a legal requirement. Yeah. In, in public discourse and in legislation, you know, when, when we discuss this, it always comes down to the issues of privacy and constitutional rights. How come economics is never really factored into it? I, I mean, when we talk about you know selling products that are are, are hampered, you know, by backdoors or weak crypto. You know, no one's really addressing the economic impact of that. Consumers are just not going to buy products that they know are going to be subject to eavesdropping. Um, so I think the economists are looking at it hard, but most of that intelligence is behind paywalls. I think that's the answer to that. We don't have economists at EFF, for instance. Okay, last question. That, mine sort of went along the same lines. Okay. Um, Ooh, where do we see the financial incentives with crypto? Um, well, so we see the financial incentives with bad crypto all the time, right? Um, when, when the RSA be safe thing hit the fan, uh, RSA sales plummeted. Um, when the Juniper thing hit the fan, we all know what happened, uh, right? We, no one outside the U.S. is going to buy U.S. products uh, if any of this comes to pass. All right. Um, thanks. If you have additional questions, that's how to reach me.